People no longer bound by their non-disclosure agreements. What can you now disclose? My graphic designer best friend won my town's design the Centennial logo contest. Despite having never set foot in the town, I worked for the radio station and just did an interview with one of the organizers, where he lamented that there weren't very many entries. So I called my friend and said, Want in on this? He said, Sure, as he lived on the other side of the country at the time. I spent the next day texting him photos of the town for inspiration. Anyway, when he won and they found out he was a professional graphic designer who lived on the other side of the country, they made him and me sign NDAs because the town was afraid people would think they brought in a ringer. As a lawyer, I've viewed a lot of these in tort settlements. The most common use of the NDA is to keep the award amount quiet so everyone won't sue the company. Hoping to get that sweet, sweet settlement money. Well this is already public knowledge. And they forgot to have me sign an NDA anyway. But Savannah College of Art and Design's Ombudsman Sophia Benyali, the independent person who's supposed to represent students in cases of unfair treatment by the school, married one of the school's vice presidents too and is now Sophia Eletto. It's definitely a conflict of interest but she's still serving as independent ombudsman and currently refusing to help students get any kind of refund now that all their classes are online and they don't have access to the expensive equipment their expensive tuition is supposed to be paying for. The cake cupcake shop I used to work for claimed everything was homemade but used Pillsbury cake mix as a base. Be careful if your pet needs specific shampoo supplied by a Petsum at our TGR asterisk asterisk Ming salon. Last I worked there, they weren't letting us order anything and we had to try to track down shampoos from other stores before they'd let us buy anything. Meaning if your dog needed hypoallergenic shampoo or you were paying for an expensive upgrade, it's very possible that some of the products were unavailable. Oftentimes we would have the Ferminator shampoo but no conditioner. And the conditioner is what reduces the shedding so we just have to use regular dog conditioner. We couldn't stop selling these packages because that's what they base our performance on. I was considered a bad salon leader cause I wouldn't push these products we didn't have. Also teeth brushing is absolutely useless there. It does not stop your dog's mouth from decaying at all and you'd be better off buying an enzyme. Toothpaste from your vet and brushing your dog's teeth every day. The toothpaste we had basically was just to make your dog's breath seem better for a little while. Oh and the reason a bunch of dogs died there is because people were likely not following the rules. When handling dogs, almost every salon I worked at had people like that. They aren't supposed to be kenneling your flat-faced dogs anymore because of it. They're also supposed to have a set of eyes on your dog at all time when they are tethered to the floor. Someone obviously neglected to do that a few months ago when that bulldog passed away. The training program their groomers go through is not very good either. They have four weeks to basically become full-fledged groomers and a week is spent on computers. There's never enough dogs to practice all of the cuts they should know. They also don't kick out trainees who repeatedly cut dogs. They try to normalize nicking dogs so they don't have to fire people. But there is no reason dogs should be getting hurt at a grooming salon if they follow the rules. They're supposed to. The biggest problem is they barely pay anything to help you upkeep your tools and all tools cause injuries. With what they pay people usually can't afford to sharpen most of their tools that you're stuck with. The bare minimum. Asterisk hid the name more. I don't really want to reveal the name of the company. Because I'm one of only three people who have worked for the company that can speak English well. Enough to formulate more than just basic sentences. The others being a high level manager. And the CEO. The others still works there. And while I'm not interested in going back to work for the company, I don't really like burning bridges but here's the juicy gossip from the company. A majority of the software was jankily put together because the company refused to hire more developers. 
we would develop POC for features and functions. Being told that we could rewrite it before implementing it, we would demo the POC and be told to integrate it straight into the project. We were never given time to refactor anything. The CFO, the CEO sister, was constantly lying on expenses and spending huge amounts on the company credit card for frivolous stuff for her home. We thought, turns out, she had left her husband with a dream of becoming an art dealer. Spent all her savings on art that she couldn't flip. Then used the company credit card to keep chasing her pipe dream. The company, without my knowledge, forged fake employment records to satisfy visa requirements. It wasn't until the government sent me a copy of the records when I got my visa. I realized that the head of HR, another sister of the CEO, has falsified that I worked for two years for our British investors company. I was massively oversold to native investors because I had the right skin color and could speak the native language. I was sitting in meetings with the government and investors taking notes while my company passed me off as their genius-led architect. I was a junior fresh out of university who was essentially told that even though I had zero work experience as a developer, I'd now be building the project from the ground up. It was revealed to me, after working for the company for 18 months, that this was the CEO's fifth startup, and that he had essentially bled his parents dry to fund it all, until he could get alternative investments. In the two years I worked for the company, we lost roughly eight people because they were overworked and the HR was determined to bring the company back to its native roots in terms of working atmosphere. When I left the company, I stayed on for three months longer as a consultant. Forex monthly wage for three months was a bit too good to pass up to train the person who was going to be replacing me. She came in on day one and didn't turn up on day two. Apparently when they outlined all the roles I filled and projects I was working with, she quit on the spot because despite her experience, it was far too much work for her. They ended up hiring three people to replace me due to the native investors we have and how they think. The company just sold it to the investors as scaling up rather than trying to maintain output. The back-end system which was pretty much the selling point of the product we were developing, was essentially stolen from someone's Git repo and slightly modified for our purposes. Not enough to not give credit. Emo, I outright refused to work on it myself, and left other developers to work on. I didn't want my name on that code. The huge boost in quality of our backend was purely because we bought out the development of a smaller Chinese company. The CEO didn't bother to ask exactly where this group of four mid-twenties Chinese developers got it from, but it was FAAAAR beyond their ability. I was living and working in a country where bribery of government officials, like those who oversaw our progress and signed off on our funding, was so common. The country had to implement massively strict laws, so when we had a government official come round, usually to to ensure that the evaluations were fair and unbiased. We were all conveniently called to go enjoy a lunch on the company dime. All prepaid up front. But what's even more unbelievable? Two employees have too much work and have to skip lunch. We looks like that's two prepaid lunches wasted unless two individuals who happen to be free for lunch would care to join us. Yeah, we essentially would bribe the government officials with expensive meals in favor of receiving praise from them, and it was completely illegal. I had been instructed, on more than one occasion, to falsify progress so that the higher-ups could show off new features in our software for current and future potential investors. I would say on average one in three of our investors were convinced to invest based on a feature that didn't actually work. Just a lot of smoke and mirrors. By the time I had left that company, I had enough evidence that would not only force the company to shut down but end up with a majority of top-level management and a few government officials being arrested.
really left a sour taste in my mouth for working with startups. After I finished being a consultant, I started working for an NGO local to me. Lower pay, but I only work six hours a day. An office attendance is optional, currently outright banned with coronavirus. Edit. I have a million stories from the company, but most of them are interpersonal dramas so not massively interesting. But I'll update the post with any more I can think of. Edit too, because this is all pretty common for startups in this country. I don't mind revealing that the company was running out of South Korea. This is something I could spend a lot of time diving into. But the subprime lending company I used to work for as a software engineer spent a lot of time and effort manipulating the UX of our various applications to encourage customers to accept loan terms that were not necessarily in their best interest. I quit pretty quickly after realizing that the people in charge had very little interest in actually supporting us in making a product that would be better for our customers. Funny story. Moments after I was unceremoniously fired because my tech skills were found to be insufficient, the bosses who fired me demanded to know the whereabouts of a hugely important computer file I had worked on. I refused to help them. I even cited the exact language of the NDA I was compelled to sign. I am prohibited from disclosing details of my employment with anyone, including past and current employees of the company. I expounded, adding, and ask someone who works here, because I don't. It was a great fuck you moment that I still cherish five years later. But now I think I can disclose the truth. I only hid behind the NDA language because I had no clue where to find their damn computer file. Or even where to look. I suck with computers. I used to do data analysis of revenue management for some big companies. Many companies have no clue about their data or their revenue streams. I'm talking several million dollars of revenue disappearing in the pipeline and no one knowing what happened with it. Or even caring really. There were multiple times I had to inform clients that we had huge gaps in their costs and we needed to find the missing numbers somewhere in order to make our final reports correct and was met with the paraphrased reply. Just sprinkle the missing costs over the existing one. We just want the final total to be correct. All the companies cared about if the amount of money they have at the end of the year is higher and at the beginning and anything that happens in between is inconsequential. I objected at first to my bosses, saying that what we were doing was incorrect, but they said to just do as the client said. In the end, I got disillusioned and whenever our clients came with requests that made no mathematical or logical sense, I'd just execute as requested and let their analysts figure out later that the analysis they paid six figures for was basically nonsense. I didn't care, because I had documentation of all their requests and my objections which were thoroughly ignored. I had a few cases where clients came back disgruntled several months down the line after some in-house analyst had done a deep dive of their data and came up with objections that I had pointed out months before. I'd usually dig up the relevant emails and clear my name. My choice of action was to tell them to pound sand. But my boss has always been over backwards for clients. So we'd have to do the cleanup I anticipated. In the end I learned most of our economy is held together by duct tape and wishful thinking. At most 10% of people working at big companies are competent and carry the bulk of the work in. Rarely are the competent ones the ones in charge. I had to sign an NDA to work at this tech company. And I'm still waiting to accidentally overhear something cool so I can feel special for knowing something important but being legally barred from disclosing it. I worked at a gym. And in the showers there was yellow shampoo and blue body wash and pump dispensers. I found out that the only difference between the two soaps was the color. Edit memory jog as it was 25 plus years ago. Hand soap was blue. Body wash was green. Shampoo was yellow. All the same. The head shop. Smoke shop. I used to work at sold whippets. Nitrous cartridges. 
behind the counter under the guise of being a cake ingredients. All someone had to do was walk in and say they were looking to bake a cake. I'm not sure if they still do it but I wouldn't be surprised. In the IT world, it is often that the piece of internal software system that gives your company an edge is not quite as huge a deal as it seems. Often it is not much more than a couple of technologies mashed together to automate things in a way nobody else is doing yet, and those things are fiercely guarded. I had cases where people saw stuff in action and tried to replicate it but could not because they were missing just one small piece. Star Wars Battlefront 2 EA will have M-I-C-R-O-T-R-A-N-S-A-C-T-I-O-N-S! Exclamation mark. The NDA was signed in 2016. I was getting more and more worried as the release date kept getting closer and then it happened. The backlash was so strong that EA went down in the history books as most downvoted comment in Reddit's history.